Welcome to our number seven series. A fact unknown to many Bible readers is that the Bible contains numeric codes that reveal the prophetic mysteries of God's preeminent plans. The book of Revelation contains the golden key to these codes, the number seven. The number seven unlocks the symbolic portrayals of angels, demons, churches, and principalities on heaven's side. In my teachings, I will work to unveil the secrets behind the holy number. Welcome to number 11, the seven mountains and seven kings. The seven mountains in the book of Revelation, specifically in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, are the domains of the seven kings. Revelation 17, 9 through 10 says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain for a little while. The seven kings are one of the more debated passages in the Bible. These kings will undoubtedly be the final emperors of the coming new Roman Empire. These seven mountains represent the seven hills of Rome. These hills were named Palatine, Aventine, Callian, Equaline, Bembino, Queramal, and Capitoline. However, it's important to note that the following verse also refers to these seven mountains having seven kings rule over culture, religion, and political individuals. So it's unwise to be dogmatic about identifying the city of Rome as the beast, the Antichrist, capital city. I will explain this in detail in a moment. Just as a mountain rises above its surrounding area, so an unrighteous king or ruler exalts himself above his subjects. Further, a mountain is strong and may represent a king's religious or political strength, or both. In the tribulation, 
The Beast arises as a strong political figure who exalts himself to the point of declaring that he is God and demanding that people worship him. Whereas the false prophet will rule and dominate religious thought to direct worship toward the Antichrist. I am about to explain the difference. First, let's review the seven heads or hills of Revelation. Number one, Palatine. The Palatine Hill is located in the heart of Rome, Italy. It is one of the most ancient parts of the city and has been called, quote unquote, the first nucleus of the Roman Empire. The hill is next to the Roman Forum and the Colosseum. During the days of John writing the book of Revelation, it was the epicenter of world culture. This is the first mountain of the five to fall. Rome fell in 476 AD, about 400 years after John died. This hill represents cultural power. Number two, Adventine. The Adventine Hill is located in Rome, Italy. It is the southernmost of the Roman seven hills. Aventine was the religious center for all of Rome. It was also home to the wealthy politicians of the Roman Empire. After the fall of Rome, Aventine became the epicenter of religious studies and institutes. However, since the Vatican was not accepted among the seven hills, they created their own hill called Vatican Hill which is outside the boundaries of the biblical seven hills. This hill represents religious power. Number three, Kalian. The Kalian Hill, one of the seven hills of Rome, is located in Rome. It is situated southeast of the city center between the Colosseum and the Baths of Caracalla. After the fall of Rome, this hill was covered with constructions dedicated to Christianity. It reflects the story of the growing population of believers in Jesus Christ. Thus, the hill became known as Christianity intertwined into the city's essence and the spirit of its people. The hill is significant in the early development of evangelistic Christians who were determined to convert Rome into a thriving Christian movement. However, due to the new Roman state church, which worked diligently to eradicate the original followers of Jesus' gospel, the organic believers were persecuted by this new Roman state religion. This hill represents the Roman Catholic state church. Number four, Equiline. The hill of Equiline was established by the sixth king of Rome. It was known for being the dumpster for the poor, literally becoming the cemetery for the persecuted Christians and the lower level societal members of Rome. To combat this reputation, Emperor Augustus planted gardens in and around this hill. After Rome burned down, Emperor Nero, who hated Christians, rebuilt his palace on this hill, literally on top of the graves of persecuted saints. This hill represents death and destruction. Number five, Viminal. Viminal Hill was established by the sixth king of Rome in the sixth century BC. The title means weak twig. The hill was known for peasants selling their merchant goods on the street while living on the second floor of their businesses. The hill was home to the beggars and low-income Romans. For the middle-class and upper-class Romans, this area of Rome was avoided at all cost. This hill represents socialism. Number six, Quiramal. 
Quirimal Hill was established by the sixth king of Rome in the sixth century BC. The title means God of War. In early religious thought, Quirimal and Mars were early Roman deity gods who warred against any nationality or people who refuted global control, threatening the twin brothers Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. After these twins were abandoned by their father, supposedly a she-wolf who nurtured and protected them until they came into power. This Roman mystical belief is known today as the partnership between the Antichrist and the false prophet noted in the book of Revelation. This hill represents global war. Finally, number seven, Capitolian. Capitolian Hill was the epicenter of the Roman Empire's political power and state leaders. The title derives from the head of a warrior that Romulus kept in his hut, symbolizing the power of the she-wolf who saved him and his brother from death. Throughout history, Capitoline Hill was known for being the political religious partnership between the state and their temple gods. Early Roman leaders believed that the one comes with the other meaning that political power is impotent without a temple god guiding their every move and decision. It is also the reason a cardinal sat at the right side of every global king through the ages. This partnership ideology is known as the partnership and rule of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Capitoline is the political branch of the hill of Kumara. This hill represents global political power. These are the seven heads of the dragon stated in Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 4. The seven heads noted in Revelation 17 9 are the seven mountains of Rome. Even though God eradicated the kingdoms of the first five hills, According to chapter 17, verse 10, the final Antichrist will make use of their power representations in the seven-year tribulation. Cultural, power, religious power, the Roman state church, death and destruction, socialism, global war, and global political power. He does this by appointing seven kings, chancellors of sorts, to dominate and matriculate humanity into his deceptive worldview and all of its institutions. Two, assist in his global reign. An important note, according to our passage, the five mountains have fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. The one that is, is global wars. Since the death of John, Global wars have been dominating the map of the world. Not one day has passed that wars or rumors of wars has plagued the earth. Even today, the fear of World War III is upon us. These wars will be the constant that the Antichrist will make use of to fulfill the final two objectives of the last two mountains, global war and a one-world political power system. Secondly, and more significantly, our passage reveals that the great mother of harlots will be on the back of this beast. This is none other than the false prophet who rides the back of political power to dominate the religious beliefs of all humans and their leaders, the seven kings. Will this harlot whore be a woman? Possibly. However, religious thought has always been noted in biblical history as a she. Politicians have always been noted as a he. Concerning the new Babylon or Rome in the book of Revelation, this she-god is directly connected to the she-wolf 
who saved the twin brothers who established Rome. Throughout history, goddesses have been known for placing men in power. In the end, the great harlot will do the same thing for the Antichrist. The religious false prophet will ignite global beliefs by making use of a pagan system, which is both religious and political ideologies blended into one power structure. Keep in mind that the ultimate goal for Satan is to redirect all worship away from the Hebrew God and unto himself. The political forces he uses are to create such worship from the earth dwellers. In this, we can see the logic of the great harlot riding the back of the political leader, the Antichrist. In fact, political leaders are impotent without the backing of religious leaders. Looking at the new Babylon is the new Rome. In verse 18 of our passage, it says, the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Since Rome is that great city, when the book of Revelation notes the new Babylon, they are one and the same. It goes on to say in verse 9 that a great whore is seated upon the seven mountains, which of course are in Rome. The reason the false prophet is based in Rome is because Rome has always been the epicenter of the blending of religious idols and political power. While the political elements of Rome shifted to the Germanic, now Europe, the false prophet remains in the epicenter of the global religious thought, Rome. What and who is the foundation of the false prophet's religion? After the political powers migrated north, the organized Roman state church became the first of all religions to become an independent country, listed within the United Nations as a sovereign nation. They remain today the only religion in the world that holds such a status. They are by far the most powerful religious institution in the world today. What other religion holds such political and religious power? None. Think about it. If the false prophet ruled the minds of the people as a sanctioned nation, as a religion, and then partnered with the most powerful politician, what would happen? All hell would break loose. That's what would happen. The alliance of the great harlot and the beast, the Antichrist, will deliver a global system that would be like none other seen in world history. When the religious whore joins forces with the world chancellor and his ten horns, which are the top ten superpowers, the Great Tribulation will be enacted. While the political world chancellor, the Antichrist, will maintain control over the world's political forces and their money, the false prophet will be, as the book of Revelation describes her, the wealthiest religious system in the tribulation. Clothing of purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls, and a golden cup in her hand. Folks, this unisex power head will be portrayed as a very wealthy system. Her taxation of the religious system will make her rich. The riches of all past and present harlots. With this wealth comes many abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. What does that mean? She will accept any and all kinds of sexual pleasures. Homosexuality, same-sex marriages, bisexuality, transgenderism, or any other depraved cultural ideation to gain the favor and worship of all humanity. The bottom line, she will religiously legalize all forms of sexual preference. Her attractive veneer of pleasure 
will hide her hideous evil motives, that of leading the masses to worship Satan himself. Remember when the Catholic Christian Crusades started their first crusade, which was a call for all Roman Catholics to go to war against Muslims in order to reclaim the Holy Land? This marked the beginning of a series of military campaigns that lasted until the end of the 13th century, all to create global religious dominance over not only the Holy Land, but the world over. A fact known by few, this war was not with Muslims alone, but every believer in Christ who did not join the Catholic Church, such as the depraved slaughter of all those who supported the Great Reformation through the works of Martin Luther. Well, as they say, history tends to repeat itself. And this is one of those historical events that will repeat itself in the final hours of the end times. Count on it. Until next time. <laughs>